So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Adil Malia, and I am your host for this webinar for the next one hour or so. Uh, great pleasure to have you all out here, and I hope that you know between the four of us, we are able to bring to you what you really bought in for by investing your time to be present in this webinar. But before I do so, of course, the theme of this webinar, as you all know, is business, mindfulness, and more critically, the corporate transference of these two concepts, because we all are very, very familiar with this wonderful concept, but the real, that the rubber hits the road, the real problem comes is, how do we transfer this great concept to the real-time organization where the BAME is currently happening? So the theme and discussions uh, are going to be in that domain and space. I have four very, very, uh, three rather very brilliant uh, speakers and I'll give you a brief introduction to them a bit later. But before that, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, trying to explain to you that this forum, which is Learning, learning and Development Roundtable, what is it that Learning and Roundtable really does? So predominantly Learning and uh, Development, uh, Learning and OD Roundtable, is a not-for-profit community, the focus of which is to build capabilities and mindsets that can help the members drive impactful changes which are required in the society, particularly in the corporate space. It was founded around 2010, 10 years ago, by Sujaya and the rest of us. And at that point of time, we had very, very raw beginnings, as most organizations of this kind have, but with Sujaya's dedication and total attention to the space, we today are very proud to have 22,000 organizations which are members of the LMOD Roundtable. And we also have another sister organization, which is the Women Leadership Forum, which also focuses on a lot many critical issues for women talent and inclusivity and diversity challenges and issues. Currently, LNOD Roundtable is present in five cities of India, and of course the plans are to take it forward as Sujaya, uh, I'm sure, is going to take it forward. And it has run around 200 learning events, which include uh, webinars, which include master classes, which include uh, tweet chats, which include surveys and conferences. Every possible event over which learning is possible, LNOD Roundtable is present to share with you and give you and bring you the value in the space of learning and development, purely to your thoughts upon your taking membership. The entire governance of this uh, LNOD roundtable is managed by nine very, very versatile professionals. And of course, most of them are well known. So I will just run out the name, uh, Dr. Rajesh Varupadhyay, who's also a faculty member of the Indian School of Business and a very erudite learning and development uh, consultant. The second, of course, is Sujaya Banerjee. And Sujaya is a CEO of uh, her own consulting company, but is also the prime driver of this learning initiative to the LNOD Roundtable. Uh, the next is Akhil Basrai, who is also a very famous and a very uh, erudite and a very respected corporate professional. Most of us know Akhil Basrai. Rajeshwar Padmanabhan is another member of the board of directors. Uh, we also have uh, Rajesh Kamath and Prince Charles, who are also uh, 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 very, very important members of the uh, uh, Prince Augustine and not Prince Charles, sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, Prince Augustine of uh, Mahindra and Mahindra, who's also a part of our team, and he drives one of the very critical roles on the board of directors. And of course, there is Manu Vadwa alongside with me. Between the nine of us, we take the responsibility to drive the agenda of the Learning and Development Roundtable. Any doubts that it adds value, I would say just go and visit the website. Its website is www.lnodroundtable.com. And I'm sure that once you go there, you will realize the critical value LNOD Roundtable has. And it will give you an opportunity to join the LNOD Roundtable, to be a member of that, so that you can be not only part of this exercise, but on an ongoing basis, all the LNOD initiatives that we bring to people, you could be part of that story. In fact, during the current period, LNOD Roundtable provided pro bono services to what we call a resource group, which pro bono went and gave services because most corporates didn't know how to handle the situation. And a team of experts was created to be able to drive some of the services which were rendered. I think that's near about all on the LNOD Roundtable. Once you go to the website, you will come to know more about it. 
let me take the opportunity to introduce to you uh, 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 three of our very erudite speakers today. It is uh, my privilege to be a moderator out here. And the greatest uh, 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 pleasure for me is that all the three uh, speakers out here are my personal friends. Uh, let me introduce uh, Mickey Mehta. And of course, I'm not going to spend too much of time because he's such a famous man. He is available there. Every, uh, every, every celebrity who you see in any kind of uh, yoga outfit at Marin Drive or anywhere else, you will see Mickey Mehta out there. And he is a life coach. He drives a lot of positivity and he's going to talk to us also in terms of how wellness becomes very critical at this point of time and what wellness does and how wellness gets affected in this period of time. So how do we rejuvenate ourselves to be able to drive the situation? Rajendra Balve, who is also a friend and a Louis Hayes uh, kind of uh, coach, uh, he's a psychiatrist by qualification and practice and drives a lot of uh, mindfulness because as much as the body is critical, more critical is the mind because mind is the driver of everything else. And you can see from his personality that he's someone who really understands the human mind so much more better than all of us can. And he's going to talk about mindful leadership and tell us about a lot many things about how in events and situations like this, mindful, uh, mindfulness of leaders is very, very critical. So Jaya brings in years of experience and corporate world and in consulting, particularly in space of leadership development, management consulting, and DNI practice. And uh, she is going to tell us from the experiences that she brings on table as to what is it that organizations need to be doing really to transfer these wonderful experiences and knowledge and, uh, and things that we are talking about. How do you transfer all of these into corporate packages where people who are at the end of the receiving part of the organization, your employees, your managers, your vice presidents, your decision makers, what is it that they ought to be really doing to absorb these concepts and transfer it into real-time situations and not leave it only at the theoretical level. So that's the kind of an overarching keynote to what we are going to be talking about. I'm going to be beginning uh, with my friend Rajinder and I'm going to ask you this question. Rajinder, have you actually, yes. and not in theory, have you actually experienced any kind of an upsurge currently in mental disorders uh, which you can directly associate to the last two months of people operating from home. Have you experienced such an upsurge uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the mental and psychological makeup of people operating from home? Yes, indeed, I have experienced it many times because I'm, this is a time for telemedicine and I'm available to my clients and people who are in need of uh, uh, service of mental health. Uh, I, they reach out to me on my WhatsApp, they send messages, emails and whatnot. And most of the clients who were with me earlier, they have a surge of uh, their anxiety symptoms, they're de feeling depressed, they're not, they, it's like lost purpose in life, what am I doing? Oh, they say yes, everyone says be happy, just do homework and ch chat with family, but how long? I mean, it's, it's become very tiresome. So first couple of weeks, we had people calling up all the time about feeling very anxious and upset and, and depressed. But now, last one week, I'm getting calls where people are feeling very, very low, fed up, frustrated, and they're just feeling, they just kind of want to write off everything. And just, so, just even if we die, it's okay, but we want to get out of the house and work. So that's the situation that, that I see today. And uh, this is what worries me the most. Because this is the time when, uh, when we feel so frustrated, angry, upset, and resigned, our immunity really goes down and we really can't. Then there are the, we become victims of such a uh, pandemic. But I think before Rajendra, we get... Yeah. Rajendra, I, the question I would like is that, to, do you yes. at this point of time also experience that, you know, it's high time that people have been operating with a kind of a social media platform and a screen? Do you experience people coming to you and telling you that now we are getting the social media party, you know, uh, the entire talking about everyone trying to become a leader on the webinars and things like that. Is it causing any anxiety and more fatigue than what it should have been? Yes, yes. In fact, in fact, I don't want to go far away from anyone. I'm just also feeling myself fatigued because there's so many webinars happening. I mean, there is so much of knowledge and information is outpouring that I am afraid the brain will split now. 
so much of uh, happening on social media and uh, facebook and what not i think we need to put a limit to it because every time adil every time we get some information which is going to upset us disturb us or giving some bad news our adrenaline shoots up steroid goes up and then we experience tremendous stress and the exhaustion that people are feeling currently is can be called typically chronic fatigue syndrome which people experience after a lot of actual physical work but they are doing a lot of mental work in spite of not doing anything they're just sitting and just wondering and you know uh, worrying about things so it's a chronic fatigue syndrome that i see i okay good 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 uh, but what you are saying is it's real and you're experiencing is my experiencing because i am i'm in touch with people every day every minute i get calls okay good nikki coming to you of course uh, uh, would like to give you two or three and talk on how do you differentiate between mind emotion and its uh, connection to the body because the mind and the body and the emotions are all connected and the kind of experiences people are going through currently mm -hmm. all three of these sub systems have been impaired so how does this work and what what would someone like you with so much of experience in life coaching uh, be guiding and doing at this point of time so although mind is a non local phenomena because uh, in spiritual parlance we would say mind as the cosmic mind which is one belongs to everybody everybody can access it but in uh, ordinary people's words it becomes very local and very private so mind becomes your your mind my mind his mind her mind and mind because it perceives everything from 360 degrees so first of all it perceives through all your five senses then all the you know junk of the world is being collected through the mind so the junk sounds the junk indoctrination the junk visuals the junk taste food and the junk smells everything put together makes a big khichdi inside so the mind is in pieces it's fragmented it is scattered it is all over which is why when you know when europeans call it mindfulness when the west calls it mindfulness they actually miss out the most essential part of mindfulness that mindfulness is empty of junk but full of light of awareness that is real mindfulness when the pieces are pieced together and it becomes an organic unity an orchestration through which you can perceive singularly as an individual not as a duality and you can be spontaneous intelligent minus the stress minus the anxieties fears phobias insecurities which are nothing but your perception then they are not in reality so fears are out of future events okay phobias of the past haunt you anxiety of the future takes you away from the now and you are a complete divided indivisible you are from being an indivisible duality you become a divisible duality and you are completely scattered so p e a c e comes in place when all the pieces of the scattered mind are put together when your five senses become common and then through the common sense you can filter things like intuitions foresights insights extrasensory perceptions this is only when your mind is completely collected at ease in neutral shunyam quotient empty because when your mind is you are not because mind can only be alive in future or past mind is mind can never come alive in the present because in presence there is only consciousness and this is not the clinical consciousness i'm talking about this is the a causal non local electromagnetic field of energy and information with self referral cybernetic feedback loops the kind of consciousness is cosmic consciousness together organic unity so yoga typically says that yoga means seat of asana asanas for awareness so yoga where your sacred geometry merges with the cosmic geometry and there are no lines dividing it so that is where the mindfulness comes into play so when you are in asanas when you are in rhythmic breathing when you are in the state of letting go letting go letting go when you are in the state of pranayama what happens typically is rhythm is established flow is established conservation of breath happens preservation of body happens 
and your mind is completely alive in here now where patience grows tolerance grows tenacity grows resilience grows so confusion gives way to clarity fogginess gives way to vision lethargy gives way to productivity okay and all kinds of excuses gives way to absolute creativity enthusiasm and that is how this translates into building characters and personalities so mindfulness with yoga breathing meditation can translate into evolution of man Good. So, Miki, we'll come to the yoga and all of that very, very important aspects of the real-time situation as we face now. But let me do uh, for a minute go back to Sujaya and ask Sujaya this question. So, Sujaya, in your experience, and you've been dealing with corporates so closely, uh, is the romanticism around work from home, at least in the current kind of a context, and this is a very unique situation. You are not going to have this uh, pandemic kind of situation where everyone is going to be working from home at the same time. But of course, you know, the first set of experiences that people are getting is the romanticism which was built around work from home seeming to come to an end. And is work from home the real way forward or appearing to be the way of life which needs to be programmed for in the future? Does it look like the way forward? Right. I think I'm going to respond to you by saying that um, I think there's much already said about the way in which we went into this work from home format. Um, I think it is uh, not only are these times unprecedented, I think most organizations, despite their uh, emergency response uh, uh, systems, their uh, you know, crisis management teams, their business continuity teams, uh, and the fact that this, this incident had already, uh, you know, sort of already commenced uh, in the December of last year, and very many multinational companies were already looking at how it is that they, they need to start reacting to the, um, or rather responding to uh, the eventuality of this becoming a reality for us in India. Um, I think we came uh, later in, the, in, the, uh, in this whole journey, and um, you know, as compared to very many other company, uh, countries in the West, and I, I, can't, I can't underline enough how unprepared most companies really have been for this transition. So, you know, mobilizing thousands of people to work from home, you need a particular kind of technology, uh, you know, connectivity, uh, you need space, uh, you need equipment, not everyone was provided with laptops. So even when you're asking them to work from home, they need some tools, some equipment to be able to get going. Uh, data cards, connectivity, uh, access to the organization systems, uh, I think all of that took, uh, was, was, uh, was very chaotic for lots of organizations and just settling down into work from home has taken anything between two to three weeks, if not four for many organizations. I think the other big impending challenge has been the, how ill-prepared uh, managers, leaders have been, despite the fact that we've had internet for the longest time, uh, we've not looked at work from home as anything that's serious. So really leading virtual teams or working with teams remotely has not been a strength. Most people don't know how to do it. Uh, some organizations, especially multinationals, have been working with virtual teams for a while now. I, I dare say they were possibly better prepared than a lot of the others, but this has been a very significant uh, a transition for most organizations to manage. And I dare say that most of them were ill-prepared to manage this. So it's caused its own set of anxieties um, and its own set of stress to be able to just get people to settle in. The other big uh, challenge which we're now still uh, struggling with is how do you get teams, remote teams, to be productive? Um, so how do you get them to understand the task, work together? Because everyone, we're a collective society in our larger ethos. And we're used to working in teams. We like the co-worker experience. We like coming and coming together. We like sabhas. We like, you know, we like meetings. Uh, we like the collectiveness of being able to do work together. So this is a very significant experience that's gone out of people's lives, where they're now working from home, and you suddenly have, uh, you know, an office, uh, a nursery, a kitchenette, everything that you're running in the same space. And most homes are not really well equipped. Most homes, uh, you know, are not large enough in terms of space. Uh, if you have more than one person working from home, it's highly stressful. Uh, it's very disturbing. It's very distracting. And to top everything else, people are largely working with managers who don't know how to work from home, starting from not knowing how to use the technology. Absolutely. So, yeah, and I'm, go I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to just pause here to be able to say, I'm going to go back to your question on the 
um, you know, the romance of working from home. I think the romance of working from home was simply the fact that you'd not have to put up with four hours of travel to get to work, to get to work and back, which is what normally people put in. Um, it meant that you could have fresh food at home. Um, it also meant that you could spend a lot of quality time with people at home. And I think what that has, what has happened is that has come combined with the anxiety of an unambiguous and uncertain future. Uh, the businesses are in a disarray, so you don't know what the longevity of these businesses are. Um, uh, hardly two weeks into the lockdown, and we had already started reducing uh, headcount. Um, everyone was announcing job losses left, right, and center. And that's very scary because even if people are not there yet, um, they're all wondering how, how much time it's going to take for them to be on some uh, exit list, on some redundancy list, and so on and so forth. So it is an impending fear, even if it hasn't happened uh, to people, particularly those belonging to larger organizations or organizations that have been sane or perhaps have the uh, financial uh, viability to be able to continue having people on board. So I think that, uh, that the, it's come combined with, there, are, there is a great degree of advantage because if you look at how much we were burdening the infrastructure, you know, the way in which people had to burden the, uh, you know, the, in, the Indian railways carries one crore people to our local railway system in Mumbai. So if you just look at just Mumbai, you're actually ferrying one crore people every day. And that has a huge amount of risk in terms of loss of life. And we know enough of how many lives have been lost just trying to get to work. So I think it kind of takes away that burden. It reduces cost in a way in terms of if you're not going to have your offices uh, anymore. Uh, I think it can reduce the cost of doing business because there's less of travel and the rest that is involved. Um, so there are many advantages, the advantages of family life, work-life balance. Um, you know, like I said, you can pace out your work if you're working with the same leader. Um, you know, you have lots of advantages of being, you can have fresh food, like I said, not have, have the turmoil and the stress of having to get to work every day and back. So there are evidently many advantages of this. Now, what does this come combined with? It comes combined with the fact that most societies, and in fact, almost all societies have not allowed for part-time help to be able to come into the house. So this really means that in the same amount of time that you have, where you're supposed to be productive at work, you're also supposed to keep your home clean, you're supposed to do your own cooking, you're supposed to get your own groceries, um, you know, you're supposed to run around paying your utility bills, I don't know, whatever else it is that you need to do to be able to survive. And but those who have, have children... Situation, it's not going to be the kind of way I work from home in the future. Uh, no, so I want to I want to pause I, I want to I want to interrupt there to be able to say that we don't have a vaccine and there's no sign of the vaccine for the next 12 to 18 months so this is indeed the way in which it's going to unfold into the future I mean large companies have already announced two and three years of work from home and increasingly you're going to see more and more companies ad adopt this and and you know uh, even post the lockdown it's going to I think the whole recovery process is going to be significantly slow before you start seeing people come back to work uh, they're not going to be any permissions for any form of congregations in terms of getting people in large groups into meetings or discussions or off-sites or any of that. Uh, they're not going to be permissions that are going to be provided for malls or for theaters, wherever it is that people are, are not going to be able to maintain social distancing. So the social distancing piece is going to remain, is going to remain a part of our lives. The masks are going to remain. They're going to be part of the precautionary measures that yeah, we take. That. Will we have the vaccine on the vicinity? This is going to be a way of life. So people are going to have to adapt to this. So I'm just going to pause here because I know you have more questions. I'm just going to pause here to be able to say it is indeed, it is indeed the future. Of our I would like, I'd like to take you on to this. This is for the benefit of those of you who have just tuned in late. You have tuned into the uh, webinar conducted by the LNOD Roundtable where we are talking about wellness, uh, mindfulness and its corporate transfer, uh, transference. Now the question for you, Rajinder, is that the, yeah. as Sujaya is saying, the particular condition in which this work from home is happening is bound to yes. create a state of what we call neurosis. Neurosis for those who are uninitiated to psychology, predominantly small kinds of illnesses, yes. mental illnesses, which are caused by things like stress, depression, yes. uh, hypochondria, yes. anxiety, and those kind of things. Yep. Now, the question, Rajin, yes. there is most of the people will tend to reflect those kinds of symptoms at home which people who are not trained may not be able to see that these are symptoms of, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, neurosis. So question yeah. is, what are these symptoms that you think that people should be mindful of, uh, you know, 
so that they or even the leaders who are dealing with it should be mindful of so that they can then come and provide some kind of help to people. Yeah, uh, I think I'll come to that uh, answer. Uh, but before that, uh, I will just ask everyone around, all the participants here, are we here? Are we here because our mind is wandering so fast that we really don't know that we have missed few things? And I'm happy that uh, Adil, you have summarized it very well. So uh, the whole idea of mindfulness is just being aware, being aware of what we are and where we are, what is happening inside us. As very Mickey said it so well, so beautifully, I would say it's not the question of emptying the mind, but just find out what the mind is full of. And what the mind is full of is this tacit intuitive knowledge, the foresight, insight, and also compassion that we feel. And what is happening right now is because of this, this very artificial situation, number one, number two, to which we are not exposed, we are not trained, we really don't know how to handle this. This is going to cause a lot of distress to everyone. Just a few days back, when they opened the liquor shops, you see the huge crowd. Now, that, that indicated that people just want to escape this reality. And what I see a typical Indian scenario is people constantly escaping into something. And they may be escaping into neurosis, anxiety, depression, and constant interactive problems with their near and dear ones. It's like the expectations are going to be very high. Everyone wants just to be understood. And nobody is willing to talk to people in a very meaningful way. So part of the story is loss of compassion that I see in a big way. And compassion is what connects people for us to survive, to carry on for love and affection. And mindfulness is, is a key of knowledge, key of uh, insight, key of Atma Gyan and also compassion and Karuna. So it's very important that we go back to these ideas and bring this into reality in our own homes. And when people are at home, like very rightly said by Sujay, particularly for women, they, they have to run the household anyway, and now they have to run the household uh, and along with the office. One thing which I, which I see, uh, I, I talk about the escape. See, the travel is very bad, but the travel also gave people some space to switch off the channel of the work and come back home. So it's like having two different places. Now the place is same. So all stress which is caused by the work will remain at home. So I think it's a very, very difficult time. And I already see people's lifestyle changing in the not right way. I don't think people are exercising adequately. We see it. India is already a capital of diabetes. India is already a capital of uh, hypertension. And this is all going to increase essentially because people are not really ready for it. Secondly, we are also going to see a, a surge of depression as it is. We see every one in seventh person has a mental health disorder. One in every fourth person requires mental health uh, help. And now this is going to multiply so many times that who is not going to need the help? And are we ready for it? There are not enough spaces. There are not enough doctors. There are not you know, trained people to respond to this situation. And I'm really worried about everything. I'm really worried about people who are helping also. I mean, you see the doctors and the police, everyone is worn out. So we need to have, we need to have a community which gives space to people to rejuvenate, to re -take, re take breath again and come back to their own life. And I think Almiti also might agree with me and mindfulness seems to be the way or yoga sana seems to be the way to, to bring yourself down to what you are, to again come back. The soul is embodied in human body. So bring it back, bring the connection back to yourself and connect to the cosmic energy. That's what mindfulness is all about. And we are need to be constantly aware. See, there are going to be negative emotions, negative thoughts, a lot of pessimism because people are tired. And where are going to take it off? Either they will take alcohol, they smoke, and they will take it on their spouses, on their children. The children also will be at home. There may be homeschooling. So the home is going to be a, a crucible of problems. And we are not ready for it. As Sujay said, we, we are not really ready for it. And it's time that we start getting ready because this might last for, say, two or three years. Sure. Now, Nikki, I want to continue this thread. And, you know, you are the guy who has been always uh, 
uh, uh, perceived by people as someone who gives a lot of practical advices and things like that. So if this kind of neurosis is prevailing in organizations and the people who are going to be value adding partners to the businesses in the future, and if they are going to be suffering from neurosis, naturally the impact on the industry is going to be high. So what are your two or three very, very practical recommendations of what people should be at this point of time doing to be able to counter this kind of stress? And how can you help to create wellness all over again in life with this kind of a situation that's prevailing? So let me tell you in the last 300 to 500 years, ever since any kind of industrialization happened, man has become mad. Now man has become the biggest hypocrite on this earth also. <laughs> throughout, throughout the decades, he's been crying that there is no time. And when nature has given so much of time in abundance at home to self-develop, self-cultivate, self-evolve, connect with family, have home food, and have time to look after your wellness, he's again crying. I mean, I feel very sorry for that man. Champions are born out of challenges. People will lose jobs. People will have to reinvent themselves. For people who are not relevant in this time, will certainly suffer. And for people who reinvent themselves, will certainly grow. Now, what are the things which can change the landscape of your wellness? And how do you deal with depression? So let me tell you what is primary to human life. Primary to human life is breath. And if this breath is regulated and disciplined, all your problems are solved. That's number one. If a human being breathes in a disciplined way with regulated functions, your lungs, your heart, your digestive system, your endocrine system, hormones, your immunity, your, uh, you know, your toxic toxins elimination system, all your organs will function as an organic unity, thus giving you immunity. So that's number one with the breath. Number two, when people ask me, what do you eat for breakfast? I said, I eat breath for breakfast and I soak myself in the sun. I really take a lot of sun in the morning because in the presence of the sun, maximum metabolization happens in the body. Optimum functions happen. And also your sleep-wake cycle, your circadian rhythm becomes very active in the sense. But making your home into the houses, where will you get the sun from? Windows. Balconies, doors, every household has a window, direct or indirect sun you'll get. You will have a direct or indirect view of trees. You will have a direct or an indirect connect listening to the chirping of the birds. So looking into the infinite sky, you feel the infinite expanse within. Listening to the chirping of the birds, the, you know your nerves are soothed. When the air touches your body, you are completely calmed down and tranquilized. When sun hits your forehead, serotonin is manufactured and there is an energy surge. So if we were to mingle with all the elements, then of course we will have invincible, infinite immunity. But don't forget, eat clean, eat green, be sensible, ethical and intelligent in choices of food. That cleanliness has made man, that, I would say that dirtiness which man hasn't followed, and has made him a gutter from being a garden. So we have the potential of becoming gardens and orchards, fragrant and sweet once again. This is a wonderful reset. This is a wonderful reorientation. This is a wonderful turnaround for this universe. Swikriti is the biggest, biggest aspect of mankind. And this Swikriti brings us to Vairagya. Vairagya is not social distancing, it is distancing from desires and wanting more. If man were to drop completely his want for more, then pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, sloth will not degenerate, disintegrate the mind. Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Moha, Madh, Maya, Matsara will not kill the man. So this brings this ease, this ease gives rise to ailments. Ailments brings disturbances, decay and death. So death has no right on life. Death is the culmination of disease. Diseases are, are the culmination of your choices. At every given point in time, we, were, we are confronted with two choices. Choose evolution or choose entropy. By negative, social, mental, preconceived conditioning, we constantly choose entropy because we keep reacting. We don't respond to life. 
so this is the problem of mankind he doesn't breathe he doesn't exercise he doesn't eat clean he doesn't sleep well he doesn't meditate laugh sing dance and he blames it on everything outside of him and never takes responsibility that makes him very weak and trust me madam no offense to you that sujaya vaccines are for the weak health is for the brave so if you are healthy you will save yourself from the grave health yeah vaccines are for the weak because vaccines literally destroy your independent individual immunity and it gives its crutches which mm -hmm. means in 20 years time there will be 50 vaccines you will have to take if you fall a prey to it you will not get a driving license without it you will not mm -hmm. get a cinema ticket without it your child will not go to school without it can you imagine your police will not register a complaint if you are not vaccine this whole mm -hmm. this whole lobby is driving us crazy and the media pharma connection caucus is driving this whole phobia so please be free we are human beings born of a mighty power of a mighty purpose our human consciousness is grace disease is disgrace we can rise on the ladder of consciousness and rise above gods or we can fall below animals you know when creativity reached the pinnacle of existence man was born and when man reaches again to the pinnacle of existence with creativity god again can be born so krishna christ shiva me you mohammed buddha we are all gods in seed form and gods who know how to heal heal thy heal them heal thou that's the etiology of health organic unity for human immunity that's great super thank you yes. friend what a beautiful way in which you express yes. really loud because so yeah uh, yes. most important again coming uh, back to you at the corporate level where you know yes. where the real problem uh, that we are talking about and most of the people attending this webinar are interested in knowing yes so uh, i like your attention to this question on the issue of diabolical balance on the one hand there are organizational realities of survival there are no businesses happening there are no customers no clients no orders everything is running dry on the one hand cash flow problem is a reality of the organization it's not an emergency that's one reality that businesses and leaders have to manage on the other end we have an employee expectation which says don't really care whether you're really making money or not but i have been a critical member of this large vasudeva kutumba that we have been talking about all along so you need to take care of me at this point of time irrespective of whether you have the business or not whether you will survive you will not survive so what really in this diabolical balance is your recommendation on how to manage how to manage survival of the organization on the one hand and on the other hand how do you ensure that employee happiness and survival is also taken care of some thoughts on it you right so i think it requires a very omniscient person to be able to connect up all the dots of the future i think a lot of these are unfolding as we speak but i'm going to still uh, attempt i'm going to i'm going to try a jab at what it is that you just asked right now i think what i see organizations do uh while you've uh, figured uh, well we kind of you know you painted a picture of um of doom and gloom i think that uh, you know a lot of the essential services did not close down at all um i think they continued working through the lockdown uh, we already have a phase wise uh, you know manufacturing that's already coming back the agri sector that's already coming back um so you have a whole lot of it it es organizations that are going live or who coming back in terms of bringing in a limited number of employees back and becoming operational from next week so i think uh, slowly in various sectors you are seeing some of the comeback happening and there's been very extensive planning on these recoveries that is that organizations have been actively working on uh, in the last couple of weeks i think i want to be able to move away from this picture of doom and gloom to be able to say that this is a reality we didn't we, we could never 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 ever have been enough prepared for this pandemic there's no one living in this world right now who's ever experienced anything as incredible as this maybe other kinds of um, challenges and all other kinds of disasters but i think this is very uh, extraordinary this is a black swan event and i think that um, you know this is a kind of giving to life demonstrating the necessity being a mother of invention in terms of um, innovation in terms of shifting mindsets um in terms of uh, leadership which was very
command and control and power centric, which is suddenly looking to, um, you know, distributed leadership formats. Uh, so you're seeing decisions being made closer to the place of problems. So you're seeing a lot more empowerment that organizations are experiencing. Um, IT project digitization has taken the kind of speed that it has never seen before. Projects that were stuck for two and three years, suddenly in two or three weeks, uh, they have come to life and they are now, you know, operational in terms of being able to bring new solutions to the organizations that are now stuck in a remote way of being able to really uh, bring services or bring reprieve to both employees and to customers. So I think we've done very well in terms of, um, you know, being able to respond to this uh, rather uh, sort of unprecedented uh, crisis. Um, I think we've seen organizations that have understood early in the game that the old playbooks will not work. So we've seen a lot of adaptability, a lot of shared mindsets. Um, you know, you see the automobile sector that has pivoted quickly enough to be able to manufacture ventilators. You've seen, uh, you know, whiskey distilleries, which are now pivoted and manufacturing sanitizers. You're seeing carpet manufacturers and socks manufacturers now manufacturing masks and gloves and other equipment for the medical fraternity. I think we're seeing some incredible innovation that is coming out of this. So, uh, you know, I want to be able to, to, to bring forth some of these examples to say these are incredible times to change. These are incredible times to adapt. These are incredible times to become harfan mollas. You know what I mean? Do what it takes to make things happen. And I think we are witnessing, um, you know, all that collaboration we were crying out loud for. We suddenly see a lot of that unfold uh, inside organizations. I'm seeing organizations use this time to invest in mentoring as a capability, saying that if we actually get leaders to become mentors of more people, we'll be able to use this quite well uh, to be able to grow more leaders. So I'm seeing some incredible thinking in that space to be able to say even in the middle of a crisis, what are the uses of this adversity? Because sweet are the uses of adversity, not the adversity, it's uses. And I think a lot of wisdom that we're seeing unfold in terms of organizations wanting to use that. Now, I dare say that organizations, uh, you know, that have perhaps got lesser resources, um, which were not able to adapt, adjust, uh, pivot as fast as some of the others, are taking a little longer to be able to get there. But there's a very, 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 you know, like, uh, uh, you know, when Mickey was talking about the inner vitality, when he spoke about not needing a vaccine because you have the inner vitality that the good Lord has already gifted us with. I want to talk about the vitality that exists inside organizations. There is already that we vitality. For one minute, because we are running short on time, so can yes. you wind down? Yes, in 30 yes I will. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying that there is vitality already existing inside organizations. There's a positive vitality. There's a vitality of optimism. I think for individuals, we're seeing individuals also react differently, behave differently. I'm seeing organizations trying to drive these massive exercises to be able to now give more meaning to their culture, give more meaning to their values. Um, I think we're seeing more compassion at this time. And I think organizations are talking more about compassion at this time. I think there needs to be a little more uh, empathy around what it takes to work from home. I think that is one space of work that leaders will have to do, which is to be able to understand that uh, we have a very young population as a country. So lots of people are raising young children. Uh, so they're having the responsibility to school these children at home. They have elders in the family who need to be taken care of. There is no house help. And you're dealing with uh, uh, people, managers and leaders who don't know how to work remotely. I've heard of horrendous stories of leaders asking their uh, employees to stay connected the whole day or let's connect up and do a catch up call every one and a half hours. I think this is really unfair and it doesn't give people time to live, to be able to eat, to be able to do what they're supposed to be doing, which is helping the rest of the family members. So this is a new way in which the society needs to work together. And I completely agree with what Rajendra said and also what Mickey said the time for more compassion. Somehow we've seen compassion as a very, very weak word for the corporate world. Compassion is a very strong word and it goes very well with accountability. In the business world, it has its space with accountability. So compassion with accountability is what I'm going to finally say before I stop. Sure. Uh, Rajinder, uh, one more question for you before yes. we wind up. Yeah. Uh, you already spoke about neurosis. Anyone yes. who has read even two chapters of economics makes a great prediction that we are all going to yeah. be in, in the coming months into a yeah. state of an economic disaster and a depression, which is yeah. very, very obvious. And naturally, you know, the current neurosis supplemented by a disastrous economic challenge, which will create another main, True. is certainly going to uh, reach a stage of what we call psychosis. 
Now, yeah. how is it that we as okay. a society and corporate going to manage this psychology? Okay. I, I, <clears throat> we have seen this phenomena, particularly mindfulness as applied to post-traumatic stress disorder. It has been a very successful way with which people to deal with uh, post-trauma. And I see a lot of similarities between people suffering from post-traumatic disorders and the current situation. Because there are going to be flashbacks, there are going to feel very bad, we feel very disconnected. All that we see in PTSD, in a way we are going to see in the uh, post-pandemic uh, period. So, and what really worked in poor PTSD is again going back to what Mickey said in terms of yoga and mindfulness. And now there is enough research which has been done which talks about usefulness of mindfulness. If they talk only about 20 minutes of mindful meditation with complete focus on the breath, what Mickey said is right. Breath is the most secular thing in the world. There cannot be anything more secular than that. It's your lifetime partner. And we are, like I say, always say, bye-bye. Don't forget to breathe. Don't forget to breathe. So it's a, such a simple thing that a breathing can bring us back to ourselves. When you, when you focus on your breath, you are actually reducing your level of awareness, your consciousness only to within yourself. And when that happens, you find the peace, the knowledge and the compassion. It all starts with self-compassion. And when we are in that state, we start building compassion, we start building intuition, we start building the tacit knowledge that already exists inside. But it requires practice. It cannot be just done by saying, well, it sounds very good, let's do it. No, it has to be practiced. And without practice, it is not possible. Krishna says, Abhyasenu tu kaunteya vairagyana cha gruhyate. It is only through abhyas, it's only by repetition, doing it regularly, then it is possible for you to be in that state. Because mindful meditation is just not meditation. It's just not like puja, do it and come out. No, it's a continuous, constant awareness. It's like you learn how to ride, how to drive a car, but license doesn't give you safety it's only safe driving which is awareness which gives you safe driving so awareness is 24 7 that we need to have when the world sleeps the yogi is awake which is what krishna said so when we need to be awake to what is happening inside and what is happening outside so that instead of using all the templates that we have like the command and control template the anger template the disgust template blaming template we just get rid of it thanks uh uh, what I can that I think, uh, sorry, I think Rajan that there is some signal cutting that's happening at your end. Yeah, I, I so can you, can you hear me now? Hello. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes you can be uh, heard. Yes, possibly. Yeah, yeah. There was there was there, I, I because this has to be uh, connected. Anyway. So what I'm saying is that this awareness is 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 very important that awareness allows you to drive your car safely. Yeah. This and we should right. drive, we should look to drive our car safe. That's important. Yeah. And that's the car is our life. Right, right, right. Uh, the next most important yes. question, and this is by uh, public demand, Mickey. Uh, two questions, so please be as brief as possible in paucity of time. Yeah. What are the recommended foods that people should eat at this point in time? So, in terms of uh, whenever life is anxiety ridden, fear ridden, psychosis ridden, the best food to eat is raw fruits, vegetables, salads, nuts, seeds, dry fruits, because alkaline foods, they, you know, they kill the acidity in the body, which does not further inflame the mind, inflame the body, which makes you cool, calm, collected. And all the fructose of the life in the most natural state relaxes you, calms you, composes you, fulfills you, brings society, not just to the body, but brings society to your brain function and mind function as well. And Good. apart from, apart from, okay, what's the next question? The next question is, can you show very quickly one breathing technique which people can follow? Okay, so, you know, I was quick when the whole thing of Corona happened, I was quick to come out with a very new breathing innovative technique called Poison B. Prevention of infection seeding optimal nasal breathing. So like this. <laughs> And then after you do 20 of that or 30 of that, 
do 10 of that. Again, do 20 of these and do 10 of those. Now, when you do twice to thrice in a day, such combinations, dilation of your sinuses, okay? Dilation of your nasal passage and increased temperature beyond 96 to 97 degrees kills all the infection, uh, germs and bacteria and viruses. Also, adenoids which are placed behind the nose, they begin to drain completely well. Your respiratory tract is completely emptied. Five lobes of your lungs are filled in with fresh oxygen. Two on your left, three on your right. And when your diaphragm moves 12 to 13 centimeters, most heightened functions of your hormones happen. So your energy hormones, feel good have hormones, calming, relaxing hormones, and every such hormone which integrates you and makes you healthy and healing. Your, anti, your antibodies begin to flow. And also your, I would say, uh, they are called immunoglobulins. They begin to flow. And your T cells and your B cells, every gland is activated by this breathing technique. And good, good. Some people are asking. I would like to add one more thing. He, some people are asking for Mickey to show the exercise again. So the what we can do the breathing. You know, okay. Today, uh, this can be done exactly because we are recording it. So in, on the YouTube, it will be there. So yes, I would yes. request that the people should see it on YouTube because okay. for paucity of time, we don't want to repeat it. Uh, okay. One question for Rajinder, of course. Rajinder, is there a role for yes. coaching and counseling at this point of time? Very much, very much there because uh, coaching and countering is holding hand and telling people what exactly needs to be done. Like how to breathe, very simple things. How to breathe, how to eat is very important. How to be aware constantly, how to be aware of your own breath. When your mentor is there, he brings you back. I would rather than calling mentor, I call them mindfulness buddies because you need to share, talk and do everything. Okay. Can you share? It's like very simple, mindful eating, mindful walking, mindful moving around. This is very important. Are you aware of what is happening when you are walking? Are you aware of what is happening inside your body? When you are eating, when you eat very gently with all senses in place, you are enjoying it. And a mentor and a coach and a buddy brings you back to the senses. And I did. And one more, just just one more yeah. point I want to make yeah. is that what Mickey said. I I recommend I rec constantly recommend daily breathing, which is absolutely when you breathe in, when you breathe in, your stomach comes out, and you breathe out, you throw out all the air. This is very very <laughs> simple technique. There is this is not rocket science. This is simple way of purifying sure. your body and your lungs. So daily that breathing is a very important thing. Thank you to breathe. Uh, Adil, Adil, more on nutrition, vegetables are great cleansers, fruits are great healers, nut fruits, dry fruits, uh, nuts, dry fruits, seeds, herbs are great fortifiers. Super. So, yeah, last question, yes. and this is one of the yes. questions the has also asked. Sorry, if you were to really just, tell uh, organizations and leadership that one mantra which you believe will really make a difference, what would that mantra be? Um, I think I would tell organizations to not pay lip service to health, to employee health. And that employee health is not just, uh, and especially in the middle of a pandemic, I truly believe we're not talking enough about health. I think it's right at the center of everything. It's right at the center of human survival. It's right at the center of how we should be treating people in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I think we should be helping people uh, with more than giving them diets and giving them uh, sort of, uh, you know, apps, which are diet apps or nutrition apps. I think we need to be truly concerned with health and not just from a compliance perspective, but from a care and compassion perspective. Very well said. Very well said. Very well. Lovely. Uh, is there any one... One, one, one word yeah. which I would like to say is that yeah, right. with social media and television, like Mickey says, what we eat inside, what goes in the stomach, we also need to be taken what goes in the brain. I mean, there is so much of clutter, so much of dirt that goes on inside the brain through social media, through news media and through uh, Facebook and whatnot. That's all. It's all dirty, dirty things which are going inside. When we are... Mind that, would, you, yes. would you recommend some kind of a quota or some kind of a rationing on how many hours in a day would you uh, recommend people should be on social media? They should be... They should be 
occasionally i can say occasionally just to check few facts about their near and dear ones because all the time they are all forwarded messages they mean nothing but really connecting to people who are lost in times is great time i am connected to my friend whom i have lost 30 years back so that gives tremendous joy not who where how many deaths are taking place so just occasional connecting to people is very important just occasional every few 3 4 hours or once in a day at the most adil adil i have a last uh, open uh, closing statement that extraordinary are those who know that there is something within them which is superior to circumstance life will keep changing and if we at all we don't change consciously with it accepting it and we don't become choreographers of our change there will be a doomsday there will not be a doomsday brought about by any virus the doomsday will be brought upon by us ourselves so be the choreographers of our change thank you for choosing three idiots thank you for uh, for mr malia from coming back from london we are very grateful to you so it is a great pleasure i should thank each one of you there has been great amount of learning from rajender we realized what is the criticality of mindfulness and the kind of mind and the kind of neurosis and psychosis it generates unknown to us we believe that you know psychiatric problems are only big problems which has to take us to some real madness and we have linked ourselves and to understand that very limitedly and wrongly however with this kind of situation how is it that health and wellness can really help us to tide over the situation some yogic exercises some things about the food some things about breathing all very practical things that we could do from home and sujaya thank you very much for telling us that where the rubber is the road how should corporate leaderships and what should corporate organizations be doing in the current situation so that ultimately we recreate this wonderful world we recreate the happiness that we have all wanted this world to create for us and we once again be the happy people in this world that we live so thank you very much amen amen to that thank you thank, thank you so much thank you all the thanks to thanks to thanks for being there and investing your time and being part of this website thank you thank you adil thank you thank you, thank you everybody take care